thank you, Mike, for that very generous introduction. Uh, it's about the nicest I've received since uh, the person who was supposed to introduce me got sick and they let me introduce myself. Uh, I was asked to come and you know, we were talking about what, what I should do and since I'm one of the early speakers, they said, uh, you know, why don't you do sort of a scene setter, kind of a, a lightning round of uh, issues relating to strategy. And uh, so, uh, so we agreed on that. And uh, I, from my days as a student here, you know, way back in the, the dark ages when we only had one big problem, I said, well, you know, back in the day it was traditional for the speaker to tell a joke. And they said, yeah, yeah, you should probably tell a joke. And I said, uh, I, I don't tell jokes very well. And they said, yes, but uh, we've heard you speak and you should probably tell a joke. <laughs> and. Uh, so uh, I said, well, you know, why don't I just try and set people's expectations before I start? And uh, they, said, they said, okay. Uh, th th that was after I told them that the only jokes I knew were, were jokes about physics. And uh, that I was up at Lincoln Labs, and I told my physics jokes to the uh, physicists, and they didn't laugh. And they told me their physics jokes, and I didn't laugh. Uh, they said, because I didn't understand what they were talking about. But anyway. Um, I was out uh, in Nebraska uh, a couple of years ago. A friend of mine who was a provost out at the University of Nebraska at Kearney, it's out in the Panhandle, uh, they were having a speaker series. And the, uh, uh, there was about eight speakers, and uh, so I, I was one of them, and I went out, and uh, there was a nice dais, and uh, you get up and you give your talk. It's kind of an evening thing, you know, people have eaten their dinner. And so I got up and my, my friend was on my right and somebody was on my left and got up and gave my talk and finished to polite applause, which I always think is a good thing when you hear a speaker, you know, polite applause at the end. And I uh, sat down and uh, I was feeling pretty good and uh, turned to the fellow on my left and uh, said, well, yeah, what'd you think? And in, in Washington, you expect somebody to give you the polite answer. In Nebraska, you get an honest answer. And uh, this fellow said to me, uh, let's see, it's an eight-speaker series. Uh, you're the sixth speaker. I have to say you're about the worst. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, you know, my jaw just about hit the table. And I, I kind of turned back to my friend who had invited me out there. And he was talking to somebody else. He turned back toward me and he saw the look on my face and uh, he saw the other guy was kind of smiling and he turned away and my friend said to me, oh, hey Andy, uh, hey, don't mind that guy. Don't listen to him. Uh, don't pay attention to what he says. Uh, he doesn't even have a mind of his own. He's just repeating what everybody else is saying. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there, there's, there, I'm setting your expectations now. Uh, what I'd like to do, uh, in, uh, as, as quick as I can, is to talk a little bit about uh, security challenges, uh, the resources we have to deal with them, uh, and a little bit about strategy, and hopefully give you some food for thought in the discussion that follows in the seminar sessions. Um, to start out, I guess you know, one of the fundamental things we think about in terms of strategy is you know, we've had sort of an enduring way of preserving our interest over time. Uh, as a global power, and assuming that we want to remain a global power, uh, in order to preserve our security and our well-being, uh, we, have, uh, engage, we try to fight our wars as far away from our homeland as possible, which gives us enormous strategic depth if we use it right. And that's an advantage that most other countries don't have. And one of the core principles of strategy, and I'm going to repeat it as I go through, is strategy is a lot about identifying, developing, and exploiting areas of advantage. And having great strategic depth is an advantage. Uh, second, uh, by going, say, to fight our, our, our wars away, uh, we go to key areas of the world and we engage and have the good fortune of having powerful allies, which is another source of advantage that we have relative to, say, our competitors or our rivals. And third, it enables us to maintain 
access to key areas around the world uh, as part of a global economy where we need access to resources and trade uh, to help uh, sustain uh, our economy as, as the most vibrant and uh, powerful economy in the world, at least up to this point. Uh, so these are important advantages that we have. And as Admiral Howard said, those, you know, sustaining and, and maintaining those advantages uh, really relies on our ability to have access, access to those regions, because if we don't, our allies uh, and partners begin to wonder uh, if we really are uh, going to be able to assure them to provide the kind of capability that we, we say that we will, that we're committed to. Uh, it also runs the risk that key parts of the world with great industrial power could fall under the control of adversaries and thus reducing our strategic depth and you know, not only imperiling our economic uh, well-being but our, our physical well-being, our security. Uh, so again, there are several regions of the world. Uh, one obviously is Europe, uh, another has become the Middle East in the recent decades, and then the Far East. Uh, where we have important security interests, important economic interests. And of course, we have to maintain access to the global commons, which have been expanded from the maritime domain, as Admiral Howard said, to the cyber domain, and also to space, in order to be able to move goods and services, but also move military force if we need to, uh, to, uh, to support, again, our interests in those parts of the world. Now, what I'd like to do now is, is just talk about some of the challenges uh, that we're, we're confronting. And if I could give you the bottom line up front, uh, challenges are going up, resources are going down, which means you really need to think hard about strategy. Uh, the best way to use limited resources, the most effective way to use them in order to preserve your interests. And the way I look at it, uh, I don't think we've seen this kind of environment in terms of the strategic challenges that we are confronted with since the late 1940s and early 1950s. You know, we fought the Cold War. Uh, it was a radical shift uh, in terms of our thinking in the late 40s and early 50s. You had NSC 68, 162-2, the solarium effort. Uh, a lot of smart people working the problem. At the end of the Cold War, there didn't seem to be anybody out there. And so, uh, arguably, we became a little bit strategically lazy. Uh, well, now it's time to put our thinking caps back on. In terms of the challenges to our security, uh, relative to the last 20, 25 years, they're growing in scale and shifting in form. Uh, certainly, uh, when we did our planning in the 90s and the early 2000s, uh, when we did the MRCs, MTWs, MCOs, you know, re major regional conflicts against relatively small adversaries, you know, the Libyas, the Iraqs, uh, the North Korea planning, those sorts of things. Uh, that's small potatoes uh, compared to uh, the rise of major revisionist powers. Uh, Russia in Europe, uh, China in the Far East, uh, and of course Iran uh, for quite some time now in the Middle East. Uh, these are countries that don't like the existing international order, and it's not clear that they're willing to respect international norms of behavior in their efforts to shift that order in ways that are more favorable to them. And of course, we see the Russians acting upon this, uh, looking for territorial gains uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, the Chinese expanding their claims of what actually belongs to China and their recent moves in the South China Sea, the Air Defense Identification Zone in areas uh, uh, that uh, cover Korean and Japanese zones. And Iran, which has been uh, active uh, almost since the Islamic Revolution in 1979, uh, certainly now in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, uh, in Gaza, in Yemen, in Bahrain. Uh, so we have a, a problem whose scale is much greater. Uh, than the kinds of adversaries, the kinds of concerns we had uh, in the, say, the two decades following the collapse of the Soviet Union. But even just as worrisome is that the, the form of the challenges is shifting. And as Admiral Howard said, and uh, the, the theme of this conference indeed is, uh, adversaries are looking for their own forms of advantage, 
in order to deny us access, in order to make access to the commons and access to key regions around the world where we have security commitments uh, very problematic. A simple way of putting this is the cost of projecting power is going up, and it seems to be going up uh, rather dramatically. And either we face the fact that we're going to be crowded out of some areas or the cost of doing business is going to be too high, uh, or we find a way around that. We find a way to restore our freedom of maneuver in these areas. Uh, so that's the strategic challenge. And you know, this A to AD problem, uh, at least in one domain, is the result of our loss of a key source of competitive advantage. At the, uh, at the end of the Cold War, uh, the first Gulf War, uh, what we found out was we had uh, the ability to wage precision warfare and we had nascent battle networks. And over the course of the next 10 years or so, we developed that. We uh, relied more and more on precision weaponry. Uh, we, made, uh, we developed our battle networks uh, to be far more capable than they were uh, at the end of the, excuse me, end of the Cold War. And uh, this gave us a great advantage. However, uh, you know, this source of competitive advantage has become uh, what people in the late 40s and early 50s, once the Russians tested their nuclear weapon, uh, they called our nuclear monopoly a wasting asset. It was an advantage we had, but it was going away. It was being dissipated. Others were entering the competition. And it's the same now with, with uh, precision warfare. Uh, and of course, the pace setter uh, right now is China. They, they have the most advanced uh, capabilities when it comes to precision and uh, the, the rise of battle networks. And like good strategists, uh, what they're doing is they are trying to align the strengths that they're building with our weaknesses. And they see our weaknesses as many eggs in a few baskets, uh, the few major bases we have in the Western Pacific and the, the many eggs we have in our aircraft carriers, uh, and also going after the battle networks with uh, anti-space capabilities, cyber capabilities, and so on. Uh, so confronted with a much more challenging environment, we're moving from permissive to non-permissive, con uncontested to contested environments. Uh, and the, the Russians are doing it in a more modest way. The Iranians are doing it in their own way. In fact, nobody's trying to mimic us exactly. Uh, they are all doing it with their own specific characteristics in mind. Uh, so that's, that's one area. Second is we're losing an advantage that we've long had in the developing world, uh, which is uh, nuclear weapons are, over the last 15, 20 years are now proliferated to the developing world. And when you think about nuclear planning, it's not these Armageddon exchanges between us and the Soviet Union anymore. It's thinking about the, the Russian doctrine uh, now, which is escalate to de-escalate. If you find yourself at a disadvantage in a conventional conflict, escalate to nuclear weapons is a way of de-escalating the conflict. Not quite sure how that would work in practice, uh, but this is what the Russians talk about, and this is what they're exercising in their military exercises, both focused on NATO uh, in Europe and China in the Far East. They talk more about NATO than China, but uh, still that's, that's one of the issues. Another is uh, Pakistan. Uh, which uh, Pakistani generals will tell you they've learned a lot from our experience in the 1950s, which is if you're outgunned by a conventional adversary, use nuclear weapons. They're building nuclear weapons faster than any other country, and their doctrine says if we're invaded by India, then we use nuclear weapons on our own territory to stop them. And of course, the Indians will understand that uh, they shouldn't use nuclear weapons against us. Uh, Indian doctrine says uh, we've got a cold start doctrine, which is we're going to grab Pakistani territory very quickly, call for a ceasefire, and negotiate from a position of strength. Uh, so you have two very different views of what a conflict might look like, and uh, it's not a trivial possibility that if such a conflict would occur, uh, that nuclear weapons would not be involved. And of course, the, the issue of the day, which is Iran, uh, Iran, uh, stands to become perhaps a threshold nuclear power. If Iran does acquire a nuclear capability, uh, there are some interesting observations you could make. One is that the, the missile flight time between Israel and Iran is about five minutes. 
Uh, that is not enough time for even the most advanced early warning and command and control system uh, to detect an attack, to inform the National Command Authority, to make an informed decision about whether it's a real attack or whether the system is faulty, and to engineer a corresponding response. Uh, so in a crisis situation, and one could imagine any number of ways where a crisis could emerge uh, between Iran and Israel, um, you know, how would that play out? And what would our role be in trying to stabilize the crisis situation? Uh, the Saudis have said in many different ways that uh, if the Iranians, if there's a Persian Shia bomb and if there's an Israeli Jewish bomb, then by golly, there's going to be a Sunni Arab bomb. And, uh, given the funds that they provided to Pakistan. One could imagine Pakistan providing extended deterrence to Saudi Arabia, just as we provide extended deterrence to Turkey by placing nuclear weapons in Turkey. They could do the same, and Pac uh, Pakistanis could do the same for Saudi Arabia. Only in this case, you'd wonder, well, who's actually controlling those nuclear weapons? Uh, and so uh, you, you see that there's a, uh, a rich, set of scenarios and contingencies one could think about that are certainly not beyond the pale. And given the prospective consequences of nuclear weapons use, uh, they're worth thinking about, it seems to me. Um, I'll just put one or two lines in about the, the biosciences. If you look at some of the enormous advances that are being made in uh, the field of genetics, uh, in the field of fighting cancer, many of them very encouraging. Uh, unfortunately, uh, just as science can be uh, put to good use, uh, there's talk about specifically designed path pathogens to go after si uh, specific population sets and subsets. And the fact that, uh, as uh, the late Defense Secretary James Schlesinger once said, and I don't know why he said this, but anyway, he said, if you, can, if you have the technology and the know-how to uh, to develop and run a microbrewery, uh, then you have the basic technology that enables you to uh, create biological weapons. So uh, I prefer to get into the microbrewery business, but anyway. So there is also this issue of the global commons. And if you look at space, cyberspace, and the undersea, you find that they're increasingly contested. Uh, and it's not clear that countries even know what they're doing in this domain. Uh, so in space, we see in 2007, China uh, conducts an ASAT test and creates an enormous amount of space junk, which doesn't help them any more than it helps us. So what are these guys thinking about? You know, what was on their mind before they started doing this stuff? Uh, the cyber domain, Admiral Howard covered that, I think, very well. Uh, not much I can add to that. I would talk about the undersea. Uh, when I was growing up, I used to watch Victory at Sea. And uh, while we were beating, uh, you know, fighting our way across the Pacific and everything, I noticed that after a while, uh, whether it was Guadalcanal or the Battle of the Philippine Sea or Lady Gulf, we were always shooting up the same Japanese transport ship. They just kept running it over and over. I guess we didn't have a lot of... A lot of film on that, and uh, the, so I thought, well, you know, if, if you, know, you have to worry about commerce rating, commerce defense, and so on. In 1947, two years after the war, we started sinking the first oil rigs off the, uh, off the coast of the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And now we have this enormous undersea infrastructure. A lot of it's energy-based, uh, but also, obviously, a lot of uh, communications uh, cables running undersea. And if you look back, you see that one of the first things the Brits did in 1914 was cut Ger Germany's uh, overseas cables uh, when World War I started. You also note that there's potentially, we had the BP spill, enormous environmental damage that could be caused uh, uh, depending upon how these uh, how these kinds of economic assets, not at sea, but under the sea, uh, the kind of cost we could incur if this becomes a battleground in, an, in another war. And uh, from, if you look at space, cyberspace, and the undersea, uh, what strikes me is we often rely on a posture of deterrence to deter aggression against us. Well, arguably, in each of these domains, uh, attribution is difficult, and given an equal amount of resources, uh, the advantage goes to the offense. Uh, 
So if you're thinking about deterring through retaliation, deterring through the threat of punishment, uh, if attribution is difficult, and again, Admiral Howard made a great point, who, who actually was conducting these cyber attacks on Estonia? Uh, who actually conducts these uh, you know, denial of service attacks, identity threat attacks? attacks. Um, our defense industry is attacked on a regular basis. Who's conducting the attacks? We think we might know, but do you really have a smoking gun? Uh, so many countries getting into space. Uh, your satellite that's blinded by a laser and some, from some part of the world. Well, who actually is conducting that attack? Uh, your wellheads are blowing up uh, in the... Uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, do we know exactly who's doing it? Uh, one of the interesting things we're looking at at CSBA right now is the Eastern Med, where the, the uh, gas finds, the natural gas finds under the ocean, are claimed by the Egyptians, the Israelis, the, Leban the Lebanese, the Turks, the Greeks, uh, and probably Hezbollah in there somewhere. Uh, can you imagine what it's going to be like sorting that out? Uh, and the potential for conflict there, and again, uh, uh, the, the difficulty of uh, identifying who might be the source of an attack. And if you're talking about deterrence through defense or denial, we'll just deny you the ability to conduct an effective attack. In each of those domains right now, the betting line is that it favors the offense, which means that whatever defenses you could put in place, uh, your adversary can offset them far more cheaply than you can continue to improve them. Uh, so what does that say about how stable you know, that kind of a situation might be? Uh, so those are, are some of the, the challenges. Again, increasing in scale, but also shifting in form. And if they're also shifting in form, what that means is that a lot of the, the capital stock, the military capability that we have built that's focused on a particular set of contingencies uh, may depreciate somewhat, perhaps precipitously, if we're faced with using that in a different set of contingencies. So the stuff we've had, the stuff we're building, uh, are we building it in anticipation of these kinds of uh, contingencies, or are we kind of living off uh, what we consider to be arguably the more comfortable, familiar kinds of, of conflicts? And uh, I would also mention that uh, just one theme is is the democratization of destruction. If you're looking at cyber, if you're looking at precision weapons, um, if you're looking at the ability to use uh, the internet to proselytize and recruit uh, people to your cause, uh, you know, we're facing a situation where uh, increasingly it seems to me that even small groups and individuals can cause enormous, uh, have the potential to cause enormous uh, destruction. And uh, with that, I would say we may also be looking at the return of proxy warfare. You know, we've said one of the things we want to do as a country is sort of get out of the business of large-scale stability operations. Uh, but as uh, Trotsky once said, uh, you may not be interested in war, uh, but war is interested in you. And the Russians are waging proxy warfare in Eastern Europe. Uh, the Iranians have been raising, excuse me, waging proxy warfare uh, for the last 30-odd years against us. Not clear where the Chinese are headed. But again, if, if you can uh, basically empower a small group uh, with high destructive potential, uh, then that may make that group more attractive as a proxy. And proxy is a great way of imposing costs on your adversaries, uh, as we've seen uh, in a number of instances over the years. So, so what kind of resources do we have to deal with this uh, particular problem? I mentioned the fact that uh, for me, at least, uh, this kind of strategic environment is as rich as anything we've seen since the late 40s and early 50s. Typically, though, when threats are increasing, the resources we have to deal with the threats increase as well. Uh, we haven't seen a major, from my point of view anyway, arguably, major increase in the security uh, challenges and a corresponding decline in economic resources since the 1930s. Now, I'm not saying here comes you know, World War III. I'm just saying that that makes for a particularly challenging environment. So if you have this mismatch between declining resources and growing uh, threats or challenges, uh, what are some ways you might address that? And uh, let's see. One is to increase defense spending. 
And interestingly, both uh, the administration and the Congress say, yes, we need to increase defense spending. We need to get away from sequestration. Uh, the problem is that they're both holding that hostage. And when both parties in the dispute are holding you hostage, as the hostage, you can't feel particularly good about that situation. You know, the president wants increased revenues, and he wants uh, corresponding increases in uh, domestic programs. Uh, the congressional leadership wants uh, basically other programs to be cut in order to fund increases in defense. And there they stand, and you know, we don't know if we're going to see another Ryan Murray situation or not, uh, but it makes it very difficult to plan. Now, the current glide path we're on uh, will have uh, defense spending uh, by around 2020 at less than 3% of our gross domestic product. We're up around the mid-fours uh, until the drawdown, okay? During the Cold War, we sustained over 6% GDP uh, for, on average, uh, for a 40-year period. And uh, again, uh, it's, it's, uh, to some extent, it's a matter of uh, how much risk you want to take, uh, how much investment you want to put in defense. And this is just uh, to give you an idea of how easy or difficult it's going to be uh, for us to increase defense spending. Now, this is, these are CBO estimates. And they're about as reliable as you can get. But it's, it's, it, if things remain unchanged, and of course, we can always change things. The, the, debt, the debt mountain there, there's a guy with his two kids saying, someday all this will be yours. Uh, so it's kind of planning for their future. You're going to have the handoff uh, at some point. But if you look 2014, 2020, 2025, you see that defense spending, as we go out to 2025, increases about 19% uh, over 2014. Uh, that's slower growth in the U.S. economy. So as a percentage of, of our overall wealth, that's going to decline. Mandatory spending. These are uh, primarily entitlements and a few other things. You know, the boomers are retiring. We have uh, Obamacare. We have, in the Bush administration, expanded uh, uh, coverage for, for drugs and so on. 84% here. And then that interest payments. The projection is that we'll be paying more on interest on the debt than we will on defense uh, in another 10 years. So you got to, you know, by, by definition, you have to pay an entitlement. You're entitled to that benefit. Uh, only countries uh, with very poor economic outlooks default on their debt. Uh, so if you've, you've got those two parts of the overall budget pie squeezing, uh, you've got less and less available for discretionary spending. And it's going to be interesting to see if we can even sustain under, the, under those conditions uh, uh, the kind of defense spending that may be necessary to deal with the rising challenges that we face. So, uh, what are, so if, uh, if increasing spending may be problematic, uh, there are some other ways. A second is you become more efficient. So you free up resources in order to buy the things you really need. And we've, we've had efficient, I'm going back all the way to the time I was here, uh, I think it was the Packard Commission in 85 or 86, and they were going to improve the you know, efficiencies in the Defense Department. We've had other ones that were going along, and uh, I was in a meeting with uh, then Secretary of Defense Panetta, and there's about 200 odd billion in efficiency savings baked into the current long term program. And Panetta, who was in OMB and in the Budget Committee in Congress, sitting there, and you know, this issue is raised, and this is Panetta's quote, not mine, okay, he said, he looks at it, he says, well, that's a bunch of bullshit. Uh, so the bottom line here is we often plan for efficiencies, we usually get nickels on the dollar, and actually the result can be pernicious, because if I bank those savings, um, how many Air Force officers we have here? One? Yeah. Uh, you guys, <laughs> guys, what's, what's wrong? Uh, anyway. So, you know, I've got this F-35A program, and I got all these savings that I'm going to get, all right? All these efficiency savings. And I got this big wedge in my budget, you know, I'm going to have this money. And so I go to Lockheed Martin, I say, you know what? Uh, plan on building, you know, 72 35s a year by 2019. And you get to 2019, and the money isn't there. And you say, well, remember those 72 I said you want to build this year? We're going to have to build 48. And Lockheed will say, yes, sir, we'll build the 48, but you know, we built the plant for 72, we bought the equipment for 72, we hired the workforce for 72, 
you're going to have to cover that. So you can actually generate inefficiencies as you move on your way to generate efficiency. You also defer a lot of hard choices, which, which isn't a good thing. So uh, efficiencies, yeah, we could try it uh, maybe in a res more responsible, careful way. Third is to outsource, uh, to get our allies to do more. And uh, here's a uh, percent of GDP to defense in the late 90s, and here's where we are today. Uh, some of our key European allies, of course, Japan is always around 1%. Uh, another major power, but you can see that if there's a uh, disarmament race, our allies are winning it, okay? Uh, and uh, so, you know, the issue here becomes, uh, you know, can we convince our allies that they need to do more? I was talking to a former uh, British shadow defense minister recently. He said, we've got a choice between the carriers and the nuclear deterrent. I mean, that's a fundamental choice, right? Uh, the new government, uh, now controlled entirely by the Tories, the Conservatives, is planning a 500 million pound cut in defense expenditures. The, and these are the folks who are friendly toward defense. Uh, so again, uh, it doesn't look as though our allies are going to be bailing us out anytime soon. A, uh, a fourth area uh, is to you know, increase risk. Well, we're just going to increase the risk that we're going to be able to meet our commitments. The question is, at what point does increasing that risk uh, become a strategy of bluff, where you're not deterring your adversaries and you're not reassuring your allies? Uh, I was spent about a week in Japan a couple of weeks ago talking to a number of their senior military and security officials, and one of them said, you guys scare the hell out of us. You know, we don't quite know, uh, you know how you're planning on you know, we're still waiting for the, the, you know, the, the meat on the bones of the pivot and, and the, uh, the rebalance. So, you know, there's a concern there. Uh, then the f a f another area would be cost imposition. A lot of times we look at a threat and we say, how do we respond to the threat? There's other, the other side. How do we pose problems to the adversary? And uh, we got into this in a big way in the 1980s. Uh, there's some effort uh, to uh, begin to reinvigorate that kind of uh, thinking. Uh, and I, when I was on the uh, 2010 QDR Red Team, we actually did a fair amount of work on that. So uh, as, the, as the money gets scarcer, uh, you know, looking for ways to impose costs on the other guy uh, can become attractive. And then finally, there's just, can you use the resources not only more efficiently that you have, but more effectively? And a great example of, of this uh, occurred uh, after the Battle of Midway, when uh, the Navy General Board recommended to Admiral King that we continue producing the Iowa class and begin planning for the Montana class of battleships. And King said, we're not going to do that. We're not, you know, we're, we can get a lot more value out of X tons of steel by building carriers and amphibs and other ships than we will by building more battleships. Uh, so are there ways that we can reallocate resources uh, to improve the effectiveness of our military? Um, and uh, so that, that kind of leads us to strategy. And let's see, I've got my, here we go. As I mentioned earlier, uh, and this, uh, Barry Watts, uh, they now use his definition of strategy at the National War College. Richard Rumelt, uh, strategic advisor to a guy named Steve Jobs, uh, Rupert Smith, uh, very thoughtful British general, but it's very interesting to me. You have three individuals, and they say a key element of strategy is identifying, developing, and exploiting areas of advantage. Uh, and it's also in, in, a, in a dynamic environment where your co competitors are trying to do the same thing, and as they try and do the same thing, you need to identify where your wasting assets are. You know, assets that look valuable now, like that nuclear monopoly in the early 1950s, uh, or that dominant precision warfare in the late 90s and early aughts uh, that is unlikely to last over the long term. And so how do you begin to, to shift away from that? And you know, Eisenhower said, you know, this kind of work, you know, he said the, the principles, the definition of strategy are relatively easy, but figuring out the kernel, you know, what, what new areas of advantage do we need to develop, how can we exploit them, that's the hardest kind of work. And finally, for those of you who love the QDR, and I've been involved in just about every one of them, plans are useless. Planning is indispensable. And what Eisenhower meant by that was that even if you come up with the perfect plan, 
on June the 16th, 2015. The world is such a dynamic place. Your adversaries are always trying and looking for new advantages, new ways to undermine your advantages. That planning, the constant rethinking, reviewing, reevaluating where you stand and your strategy, that's the key. That's the key, not the plan itself, it's the process. It's the constant thinking. So, we have something in the Defense Department called the, the third offset strategy. And uh, uh, Bob Work and I are, uh, he's the Deputy Defense Secretary, uh, Secretary Carter is uh, signed up to this. Uh, but Bob and I are uh, old colleagues and so we talk from time to time and I don't want to, uh, this, this is my view, not his. But uh, you know, supposedly the first offset was in the 50s, the second in the 70s, and now we're looking for the third. Well, the first offset had to do with the fact that the Russians had tested a nuclear weapon and our nuclear monopoly was becoming a wasting asset. Eisenhower essentially decided to ride that wasting asset, to extend that wasting asset, that, uh, that nuclear monopoly, as long as he could. And his rationale was the the key, the core asset he wanted to develop over time was a, a, a sound uh, economic foundation uh, to enable us to uh, pursue a long-term competition with the, with the Soviet Union. He knew the Europeans were trying to recover uh, from uh, World War II, and so putting the kind of stress on them of building up a major conventional military to match the Soviets uh, was going to cripple that recovery. And he was very concerned about uh, maintaining uh, economic probity here at home. And so that was, that was the effort, you know, to, to uh, generate and sustain that kind of long-term economic uh, and industrial advantage. In the 70s, the Soviets had caught up clearly in nuclear weapons. The, the arms control treaties kind of verified that, if, if you will. And so uh, we, we were uh, faced with a, an inferior conventional force, at least that's what we believed. And so then we had the long range research and development plan, efforts were made, uh, Harold Brown was defense secretary, Bill Perry was the, uh, the head of uh, defense research and engineering. And what we decided to do was we identified a new source of enduring competitive advantage. It was our ability to exploit information technology in the broadest sense. Uh, for those of you who were around back then, uh, Nobody was buying, uh, you know, Tandy computers from the Soviets, and nobody was playing Pong on Soviet, uh, you know, arcade uh, game uh, uh, consoles. Uh, nobody was buying Soviet color television sets. You know, these guys were stuck in the industrial age, and the world was moving to the information age. And so it was stealth, it was precision weaponry, it was battle networks, initially in the form of SDI. Uh, it was sensors, it was quieting, it was all the things that we could leverage information technology to do for us. And we, we, we just beat the hell out of that advantage against the Soviets. Uh, and we erected sufficient barriers so that, it, uh, for the most part, it was very difficult for them to steal that technology. And even when they stole it, it was difficult for them to know what to do with it. Now, what's the third offset? Now, we're in a world now where uh, we're losing our asymmetric advantage in precision warfare. And where a lot of these new technologies, whether it's artificial intelligence, big data, robotics, directed energy, they're widely available to most advanced economic powers, including at least two of our major revisionist rivals. What it reminds me of is more similar to what we found in the 1920s and 30s when most of the great powers had mechanization, they had an automotive industry, they had an aviation industry, they had radio, they were working on radar or some form of it. And the key discriminator between who emerged on top in the military competition and who didn't were two things. One was who could figure out how to, how to leverage these technologies within the context of new operational concepts better than anyone else. And so you see that even though everyone has access to these technologies, only the Germans really come up with blitzkrieg. Only the Americans and the British really develop strategic aerial bombardment. Only the Americans and the Japanese really develop what we call the fast carrier task force. The technologies were there. These countries weren't poor. Uh, 
you know, they, they, they made their decision. Some stuck with what they had, and some saw the potential for developing a new source of competitive advantage. And the second factor was who could do it faster than anyone else. Because once you figure out, you know, once you break the code, you've got to be able to actually create this capability. And the first one, the operational concept, that's part of the department's defense innovation initiative. But until it, it gets down to the services and until we do it at a joint level, uh, I think that's going to be a, a hard challenge for us to meet. Uh, the command that was supposed to be responsible for that was abolished. And it was abolished, in my estimation, for a good reason. But that mission is now an orphan. And the second, you know, doing it faster than anyone else, well, look at our acquisition system. And, uh, you know, we have, <laughs> we are not at all uh, effective at time-based competition. And until we get good at that, particularly in the world where, you, where so much uh, is, is related to artificial intelligence, big data, and so on, uh, cyber, uh, that world moves at super speed. Uh, and again, until we sort that out for ourselves, you know, so there, the good news is there are two areas uh, where we have a lot of potential uh, to develop capability and advantage. Uh, another encouraging thing is you've got Secretary Carter, who ran AT&L, uh, you've got uh, Mac Thornberry up on the Hill, uh, who with his colleague uh, Adam Smith, and work with the Senate side, really focusing now. So you've got kind of a critical mass on acquisition reform. Uh, so there is some hope there. And it's not what do we need to do in acquisition reform. That's been known for a long time. It's the, the political obstacles that we face. So to a certain extent, if that's the case, we're kind of in the, the late 1930s. And the interesting thing for me is that even though we, we lacked a lot of resources then and the threats were growing, we had places like the Naval War College where we had strategic thinkers and we had innovative operators. We had people like Admiral Sims, the president, who could testify before Congress in 1925 when all we had was the converted carrier Langley and say that the carrier is the capital ship of the future. Uh, people falling off chairs and, you know, uh, you had people like Tower and Yarnell and Reeves who wargamed it and took it out to the fleet. You had innovators like Wagner and Thatch who revolutionized the way we thought about how to conduct air operations. Uh, that all happened here then. It needs to happen here now. And I certainly think the War College is up to it. And I think this conference, quite frankly, is a great contribution to that effort. Thank you. Or jokes, physics jokes. <laughs> Simon Goldfarb from the State Department. Thank you for your comments, sir. Um, we read your book uh, when we're studying Vietnam, and the book talks about how lower levels of war overwhelm strategic thinking. Um, can you talk about if that's a concern that you have today in the fights that we're in or the fights that we may be in in the near future? I think, uh, I don't know if it overwhelms strategic thinking, it certainly challenges it because I, I think the lower you go, uh, the more dimensions of strategy come into play. There's a great article uh, by Michael Howard in 79 Foreign Affairs called The Forgotten Dimensions of Strategy one of which is the social dimension. That's always important, but he really highlights how it becomes important in uh, low-level conflict. I think we're not comfortable or familiar with that kind of war. I don't think we you know, practice it particularly well. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, we're likely to see more of it because I think proxy warfare uh, is going to be increasingly attractive uh, for, uh, for major powers. Just, you know, the, the Pakistanis are waging it against India. Uh, we see it. Uh, occurring in Eastern Europe, as I mentioned. Uh, not clear. Chinese are using the Coast Guard, not their military, for certain activities. It's kind of proxy effort. Uh, so uh, you know, this, this is something I think we'd like to stay away from. But for the very reason we'd like to stay away from it, I think our adversaries are going to continue to, to push and probe us in that way. So. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, Mo Morales uh, from Standing Joint Force Headquarters for Elimination of WMD. So far, we've discussed China uh, as an adversary and certainly uh, 
that's that's legitimate. But what do you think of the uh, what do you think are the best opportunities to try to steer them away from their hegemonic tendencies and towards more of a uh, cooperative uh, relationship with the United States? And do you see a role for India and perhaps some of the smaller um, other non-traditional partners of the U.S. Uh, in, in trying to achieve that strategy. Thank you. I think the, uh, the key is to make aggression or coercion unattractive to the Chinese. And I, I don't think they're looking for more, war any more than we are. Uh, to borrow a sort of a phrase from the Cold War, I think what they're looking for is the eventual Finlandization of East Asia. Uh, you know, shifting the military balance slowly, slowly over time, uh, to the point where uh, it becomes evident to countries in the region that they're the dominant power and they need to bandwagon with the, with the Chinese. Uh, so two things on that. One, when I was in Japan, I was talking to uh, one of Abe's advisors and he said, look, we're, we're in this. He said, you know, we're, uh, we're not going to bandwagon with the Chinese. We don't care if you, well, we do care if you abandon us, but if you do, uh, we're, we're not going to basically fall in line with China. And so you start to think about things like nuclear weapons and so on. Their military is doing some very interesting thing. Five new bases along the Senkakus that are supposed to be completed by 2020. Uh, they're forming uh, their eighth division in Kyushu is being developed into a rapid uh, deployment uh, force. Uh, they're developing a brigade, uh, uh, which basically uh, is going to be mirrored on uh, our, our MEF uh, uh, formations. But uh, they're concerned about the ASEAN states, and they're looking for us to uh, basically uh, make some kind of statement so that they don't feel compelled to bandwagon with the Chinese. So I think clearly you've got to show them uh, that coercion is, is, is not a, uh, a desirable or even a possible outcome for them. And what you really need, it, it seems to me, and what we're really not uh, uh, perhaps doing aggressively enough, uh, our think tank developed something called Air Sea Battle back in 2010, uh, which looked at air and naval operations designed with the objective of defending the first island chain. Uh, so we haven't, I don't think we've really decided what our mission is out there yet. Is it to defend the first island chain? You know, is, is our posture that? Is it uh, tripwire? Is it blockade? Is it mobilization? Is it escalation? Uh, you know, all those are potentials, but I, I don't see anything that really informs how we think we're going to fight. And more recently, I published a piece in Foreign Affairs called Archipelagic Defense that looks at the role of ground forces. And I can tell you the reason I was invited to Japan to talk to General Bancho, who commands uh, that sector, uh, he commands the Western Army, is because he wants to talk about archipelagic defense, and he, this is what he's doing. And his question is, what are you, what are you Americans doing? And you know, how are you planning? And you talk to Abe's advisor, and he says, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll cover the, the northern sector of the first chain. Uh, he actually said, uh, you need to cover the southern sector because the Philippines were your colony, not ours. I mean, you know, we have. <laughs> so you know, we didn't want to go there. But uh, anyway, it's, it's are you guys serious or aren't you? Uh, and it's kind of a big hat, no cattle. But if you're going to convince somebody that aggression and coercion doesn't work, uh, then you've, you've got to you know, say, okay, what are these guys trying to do and how are we going to prevent them from doing it so that they see that you know, achieving their goals lie through other avenues other than uh, military aggression or coercion. And uh, we could talk a lot about that, but uh, that's, that's, I think, essentially what we need to do. Thank you. Thank you.